everybody is fine. We have 19 people so far, so I think more people are going to join in, but we'll start. All right, so today for the last uh, talk of our uh, high energy seminars, we're, we're happy to have Sasha Jiboyeda from um, CERN, currently in Berlin, give us a talk about conformal collider physics and updates. Um, please feel free to ask questions and uh, interrupt the speaker. <laughs> I'm sure he yes, will be happy. Yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thanks so much. Go ahead. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Nima, for um, my introduction and for the invitation to give this talk. I'm, I'm very happy to, um, to visit you. Uh, I, I, I will be talking about um, a series of papers which I wrote with this collaborators listed below. and. Uh, some of them are a little bit older from say from last year some of them are one one month old um, and uh, this uh, conformal collider physics in the title it refers to this famous paper uh, by Diego Hoffman and Juan Maldacena from 2008 which had uh, really ahead of its time in, in many respects and uh, there are so many ideas were introduced there I think the ANIAC operator and it made its appearance and there's a bounce on the three point couplings of spinning operators, light ray operators, light ray OPE. So many of the things which appeared there and were completely mysterious. I think we uh, finally in, in, in 2020, uh, we, we understand uh, what it actually meant and uh, how is it supposed to work in detail. And so in this sense, uh, it will be an update uh, on, the, on the status of this program. And I think uh, one very exciting aspect of this program, at least I find it uh, very exciting, is that uh, in the last couple of years, there was a really um, strong interest from the people who actually think about collider physics, not you know, conformal colliders, uh, famously uh, do not depend on the energy scale. You can build any conformal collider on the table. Uh, on, your, on your kitchen table uh, because there is no scale, but in, 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 the, in the real world, the, the, the story is much more complicated, but people who seriously think about um, actual observables, they, they, they get very interested in this, in this subject. And uh, you see this paper from 2020, Rethinking Jets with Energy Correlators. And from me talking to some of the experts, uh, there is this uh, strong interest of rethinking the whole collider physics in terms of the observables that I will be talking about today. And there is a really uh, exchange of ideas between this uh, CFT community and the QCD community. So uh, in the last couple of years. So I think it's very, it's very exciting time for this uh, topic. And uh, I hope I will I will try to tell you where we are and what are the, the main ideas. And uh, there, are, there are many, many aspects to it, which I think are very interesting. So please, please ask me questions. OK, let me start with some introduction. Uh, uh, and uh, the, the basic questions that we would like to ask, and this is, uh, you can think about particle physics in this way. Uh, let's say you consider annihilation of electron positron pair into hadrons or so some similar process. Uh, and the basic way that you can try to understand the dynamics of underlying quantum field theory is to ask how the total scattering energy is divided in the final state. So here's a typical event with three jets. And uh, you can ask, okay, how, how do we characterize the final state? It's uh, some quantum state and quantum field theory. What is the energy distribution, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, people in QCD, uh, of course, uh, are very interested in this and they describe it using a set of so-called infrared uh, safe and collinear observables, also known as event shapes. And uh, the main, uh, the main uh, player of my talk today will be so-called energy-energy correlators, among many other things. And uh, I will be thinking about this question in, uh, in the context of conformal field theory. So this electron-positron pair here creates a local operator. You act as a local operator in the vacuum. And then you study the distribution of energy at infinity. That's, that's uh, what we're interested in. Let me just quickly review what's, uh, what we know about this observable in, in QCD and then the, the way it's, it's computed is usually using scattering amplitudes. So you take a scattering amplitude from- uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, Sasha, yes. but uh, I mean, uh, okay. Uh, 
you are still uh, talking about real collider, right? Where, and there is no conformal field theory for this, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, yes, so I, I'm sorry, I understand that it is kind of triviality I'm asking, but still, can I mean, I, I'd like to, to see your view, view on this, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, of course. No, that's uh, um, uh, that's true, and there are many effects. I, I didn't. I will not have time to to maybe talk about it in detail, which are related to the fact that the beta function is non-zero, that there is confinement. But uh, what will happen is that, and what is was happening in the last couple of years is that we go to this. Uh, well, one aspect of this observable infrared saves that you can uh, say here, which. I, well, the results I quoted, uh, the computation is done in the, in, the, actually in the UV with quarks and gluons. We compute the cross sections. And then there are corrections from hadronizations, which are suppressed by powers of the total momentum uh, of the reaction. And, uh, and so this, uh, this dynamics of quarks and gluons is approximately conformal. And what happens is that when we study this observables in conformal field theory and uh, say the toy model is n equal four super n mills, and we develop these tools, um, some of the structure uh, happens to then uh, translate directly and, uh, and uh, to no, the, but, but in, the, in this way, let me yeah. maybe reformulate the question that uh, even when beta function is non-zero, you can uh, uh, talk about say stuff like say uh, infrared safe stuff or yeah, collinear yeah. safe stuff, right? Yeah. So, so certain uh, aspects uh, uh, which would be kind of shared independently whether the beta function is, is not zero or non-zero, right? So yeah. my impression is that uh, you are moving to this direction or I am getting this wrong. Yes, so I, my talk in a sense about the aspects which, uh, which uh, of course for me, the beta function will be always zero and when it's not zero, there will be corrections to statements I make. But the, the part which is, uh, which is uh, sort of conformal I would say the, there are a lot of similarities between uh, QCD. And... No, but but then you can try to formulate it without a reference to conf conformality, because in so certain sense, when you are choosing this particular stuff, uh, you know, that, then it could be more, more more generic. That's why I'm asking, you know. So 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 in this sense, I ho hopefully it's uh, and I believe that what you are saying as well, uh, in directions that. You, you can apply the same kind of approach even, uh, you know, in case of running, uh, say, Kalkin as well. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think you, you, you can. And uh, all I was saying is that I will be making a few claims and uh, these claims are correct in conformal field theory or oh, yeah, the, the functions that will be a correction. That's okay. That's, but I think otherwise the approach is completely general and uh, well, as, as I hope, to show in the next. Okay. Uh, thanks, thanks, and so, <coughs> sorry about interruption. No, no, thanks. Thanks. Please continue asking me questions. So, uh, and and you see, yes, uh, that uh, well, the leading the leading uh, here in the picture, you see this state created by some operator, say electromagnetic current, and we put two colorimeters and measure measure the correlations of the energy flux. And uh, the, the leading order was was computed in seventy eight, and uh, the next leading order correction it took uh, to compute it analytically took uh, um, forty years, and it was computed in two thousand eighteen. Um, now, uh, what is special about this observables? There, I mean, there are many observables we can consider. What is special about energy correlators? And uh, one special thing about this uh, this. Uh, the observables they admit a natural interpretation. We can restate it as a matrix elements of local operators, and um, in this in this case we have the operator O, which creates a state of interest, and uh, then this uh, this energy calorimeter. Uh, let's say we measure the energy flux. It can be described by a stress tensor, which we insert far away. We integrate over time because uh, which is a detector time. With, during which the experiment runs, and here we run it for infinity for simplicity, and then n is the direction of this uh, of this insertion. And uh, if you take uh, if you take this operator, which uh, which is made out of stress tensor, and act on asymptotic states, so imagine the theory is free in the IR, it just acts as an expected energy calorimeter. It measures energies of the particles propagating in the given direction, and. Uh, 
I already I already mentioned it on my first slide. So there are in, in QCD and in this uh, jet uh, jet observable, there are I can say generally two types, and some one of them are so-called weighted cross sections, and this is energy and energy field radius of this type. There are also different type of observables which are often described, where uh, instead of studying sort of probability distributions and the moments of this operator. Uh, we interested in particular events, like on my uh, second slide with three jets uh, propagating in, in a certain direction. And in this case, the moments of this observables are related to energy correlators. But, uh, okay, let me not spend much time on that. Uh, so in conformal field theory, as, uh, as you know, there is no mass and so and there, there are no particles, strictly speaking, but there are massless excitations. And so here is a picture of a black hole decaying into massless particles. And uh, if we draw the Penrose diagram in, uh, in this case, we, we measure energy flux um, at uh, so-called null infinity, the place where the massless particles go. And if we draw this Penrose diagrams again in, in now in this way, uh, and uh, as you know, if we have conformal field theory, we, we think of, of course, we can think of it as a living in Minkowski space, but then we can naturally continue all the correlation functions and all the observables on a cylinder where the, where the original Minkowski space cover only the, the Poincaré patch, so-called Poincaré patch. Um, and uh, here you see that if you try to measure this energy flux, uh, we um, or take the operator from the previous slide, send it to infinity, uh, we naturally see that the detectors in this theory are so-called light ray operators. Uh, light ray operators, and uh, the most famous one is the so-called ANEC, uh, ANEC operator, or sometimes called if you take a stress tensor and integrate it along the null ray. So here, if we take Minkowski space with some um, light cone coordinates, we integrate it along one of the coordinates. This is a light ray operator, and here this, this integral is drawn on a blue, blue line. This is where we measure the, the energy. And, uh, for, for the purpose of this talk, I, for this purpose of this talk, I, I will call event shapes uh, as matrix elements of light ray operators. So we evaluate matrix elements of the detector operators in the, in some state. And of course, this is a very special operator. It was uh, it was uh, proven to be uh, non-negative recently and uh, attracted many attentions because it appears in in, in many contexts. So the, the picture of, uh, of uh, this talk or the, the subjects which I would like to discuss is the following. So at the center, there are these interesting observables which are event shapes. And in, in, some, in some interesting sense, so, so there is a community of people who like amplitudes or who study amplitudes uh, and you can then square them and compute cross sections and compute event shapes. And there is a community that study correlators and you take and integrate them and you also get event shapes. And so in a sense, they live in the middle and sometimes you can use both methods and you get insights from studying one method or the other. So on, on the CFT side uh, or on the quantum field theory side, uh, this, uh, as I told already, this event shapes naturally lead us to the notions of light ray operators. And uh, as we as recently was uh, realized in the-, in the uh, uh, But on, on CFT side, I'm not sure, uh, you know, to make sense of amplitude, you know, you, you, you have to, uh, to have right. some kind of definition of particles, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. You no, know, you're absolutely right. So uh, here, when I say amplitudes, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, in the context of CFT, it means per only perturbative computation. So perturbatively at weak coupling, you can make sense of, of, of the amplitudes and, uh, because this- uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. No, otherwise, I mean, I find it coupling, at fine if coupling and strong coupling, it will be always about correlation function. But, but even if you will take amplitude, I mean, in, in weak coupling, you still have this uh, kind of collinear and, uh, and infrared singularities, right? So, so, so in this but, way, but, but, it, yeah, it would be still kind of inclusive, right? Yeah, or in certain respect. So, so, so the amplitude in, in proper sense. Uh, I mean, it's yeah, not that it's, easy. Uh, in proper sense, uh, do not exist. Uh, nevertheless, as, as you probably know, there is a huge uh, progress in understanding amplitudes in NQ4 perturbatively as a result of structure. And yeah. here, amplitudes, as you say, the infrared uh, divergent or poorly defined object. But if you compute energy correlator out of this amplitude, you get a finite result. And moreover, it makes sense because it's related yeah. to correlation function. But 
it happens that sometimes it's 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 it's, it's you, you get an extra insight from understanding how uh, i mean I, i'm talking of this event shapes as a, some integrated whiteman functions mm -hmm. but if you think of this in terms of gluons and quarks even formally and perturbatively it's 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 helpful sometimes i see okay but uh, formally of course you're right there are no finite coupling such such a thing uh, Oh, oh, through the idea of CFT, this, uh, this detectors, uh, they're related to gravitational shock waves. And maybe I will uh, talk about it a little bit if I have time. And finally, these operators um, uh, made, make their appearance in a quantum information theory. Probably uh, many of you in the audience uh, know much more about that. And I will, not, uh, I will not be talking about the quantum information theoretical aspects of this, uh, this observables, even though it probably will be very interesting if uh, one can make this connection uh, with collider physics and, and quantum information more direct. Um, okay, so any questions? Let me continue. So let, this would be the plan of my talk uh, and, and the logic will be the following. So I will present to you some review, uh, quick, hopefully quick review of event shapes and nanocore for super young mills. And here, uh, the, the, the idea of this is uh, this would be the laboratory where we try to get some physical intuition what's going on uh, at weak coupling and strong coupling. And then uh, this will be perturbative. But then uh, the, the advantage of being in a conformal field theory and uh, we, we can take this observables and go to the non perturbative techniques. And the non perturbative technique I will tell you about is a light rail PE. And then uh, I will try to get to motivate and gain some extra non perturbative insight into the seven shapes, which we already will have some intuition. And finally, if time permits, I, I would like to say a few words about how all these uh, observables translate into the gravitational theories and gravity duals. So that's uh, that's a plan. So let, yeah, let's get some some intuition in n equals four, which which perturbatively behaves very similarly to QCD. So the the plots, the experimental data I showed you, we will get the same very similar curve in n equals four. Um, so here we we will consider the stress energy uh, super multiplet, and uh, I will try to be very quick about these technical details. And uh, uh, usually it's uh, convenient, and uh, a lot of this. A lot of the things I will be talking about, we can think about correlation functions, even though I told you that you have stress tensors to measure the energy. But uh, say if you take the operator from stress energy and super multiplies, there are word identities and so you can go from the stress tensors to the scalars. And as you know, in conformal field theory, the four point function of scalar operators is just a function of the cross ratios uh, where all the non-trivial dynamics lives. If you want to go back to stress tensors, you have, have to some, act with some known differential operator. So this is one simplification that is uh, useful. Uh, yes, this function f phi of u and v is known up to many loops uh, at weak coupling, the integrand up to seven loops, I think, and it's strong coupling, it's known uh, via the idea of safety correspondence. Now, in, in practice, uh, uh, the, the way uh, you might think, okay, so why is that, why is it useful, is this, is this language at all? Well, one is that it's finite coupling. Uh, but more generally in quantum field theory, what I'm talking about this event shapes, it's an integrated one Whiteman functions. So you first take Euclidean correlator, then you, you, first, you have to go and continue into Minkowski with Whiteman prescriptions. So operators are ordered as they're written, they're not ordered. Then you perform the detector integral. You put also detectors at infinity. And finally you do the Fourier transform if you want to insert a operator with finite momentum. So this is a list of operations that you would like to do. In practice, it's very hard if you try to do it even at one loop in conformal field theory. And in QCD, it's also incredibly hard even to do it one loop. However, it becomes easy in Mellon space and that's how we did it. I mean, the one advantage or one difference when, when we deal as we already discussed a little bit that on the side of the amplitudes, both in uh, QCD and in equals four, there is error divergences which cancel here at every step the object is manifestly finite, so you do have, don't have to worry about cancellations, which are tricky when people actually compute this, these things. However, say in QCD, it seems to be much harder than the standard prescriptions of this paper this year. They try to do that with using correlation functions. Yeah, but, uh, <clears throat> but in this definition, uh, it looks like in certain sense, you are choosing uh, uh, correlators, which are, uh, I don't know how to say, uh, a sense, uh, because once you said that 
uh, infrared uh, diversions cancel out, it means that it is something which uh, sensitive to short distances, right? By, by construction. Uh, yeah. But but what means short distances in 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 conformal field theory? You mean uh, that uh, it's some hierarchy of your of your uh, uh, scales? You know, it's, I mean because yeah yeah yeah. No, I think uh, let's let's. So this comment about air divergence is really real. I think it's relevant mostly for for actual the way the way people compute this in QCD and and. In conformal field theory, as I said, uh, when when we do perturbatively, we say usually you can do dimensional regularization, and then the theory effectively perturbatively is free in the IR. So um, in the but four minus epsilon. Dimensional regularization, you do not need regularization because the theory is UV finite, right? Y yes, no, I think that uh, for the CFTs, we can we can if if uh, as I said, I agree. Strictly speaking, there are no amplitudes, but there is a there is a way to think about the theory perturbatively in terms of amplitude. No, 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 no I'm trying to ask more, more specifically okay. because when you are in normal QCD, you are saying, saying okay, let's consider say deep in elastic or whatever, yeah. and then you are regulating by your external momenta that your say distances are say shorter than uh -huh. you know uh, one over lambda QCD. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, here you do not have a need to, to care about this, right? Because yeah. you I mean, there is no lambda QCD, right? Is, yes. So in this sense, um, no, how to say you have analog of operator product expansion, right? But but it is uh, referring to uh, you know quantity which, which doesn't interfere with lambda QCD, just some distances which you, in your disposal. So when mm -hmm. you are saying that it is infrared safe, it means that you are going to some kind of hierarchically short distance. But um, what I'm wondering about that. Okay. No. <laughs> what is your short distance, right? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. I think uh, maybe if I read safe uh, here, in it, it doesn't make so much sense on the CFT side. It's it's when I say infrared safe, I guess I'm just saying that it's a well-defined observable on the CFT side. So actually, I know what I'm computing in the in the actual fixed point. So okay. the, the, so, the so your short distance defined. would be defined by your by your coordinates, right? In in this sense, right? Yes. 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 So. It, on the CFT side, it, it simply means that this is a observable which can make. So, again, okay. they're referring. People, yeah, people. People make. People discuss certain observables perturbatively in conformal field theory, and then it's not clear sometimes if they make sense not perturbatively. Here, by IR safe, I mean that the, this energy correlator is manifestly well defined quantity in the non perturbative okay. theory because we can restate it as a correlator. And as you said, in no, QCD, but it's related yeah. to, to your RCP about continuation, right? Because in this way, when you're choosing particular hierarchy of distances, you can kind of very well formulate it, you know, kind of you know, how to say uh, to, to what extent you are in Euclidean range, right? In certain sense. Um, because uh, you see, you have the, your, your uh, ray direction and you have transversal direction and then you know then I would wonder which 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 uh, momenta define which distance right I mean no it's, yeah. it's relevant right yes uh, let's let's uh, let me I think I will I will not talk more about amplitude so le let's uh, yeah. let's just stick to correlation functions and then we have this okay UV and uh, and uh, so let me do this exercise for you. And uh, the result is uh, the following. So at leading order, you're just, uh, so here I'm talking now about this energy correlator set uh, at weak coupling and say um, A is a tooth coupling. And uh, zeta is a one minus cosine chi where chi is the angle between detectors. So when zeta is zero, detectors are close. When zeta goes to one, detectors are opposite. So this is a leading order result. Uh, the next leading order uh, looks uh, like this. You, you get uh, this uh, interesting, well, these functions which do not have a so-called homogeneous transcendentality, but for both, uh, for both the leading and next to leading order, if you say look at the result in QCD, it's the same alphabet, the same type of functions, but the polynomials, you see there are these polynomials, the polynomials are different. Um, and then next to next to leading order, which is not available uh, on the QCD side, we, we see that there are elliptic integrals. And again, so the prediction is that when you go to QCD, this would be the, the, the alphabet. Which which will means that at the next to leading next to next to leading orders there will be elliptic integrals. 
Uh, that's what we know at weak coupling. Finally, a strong coupling, there is this famous result of Hoffman and Maldacena that if you consider this energy correlator uh, when the two coupling goes to infinity, that it goes to constant. Uh, and uh, then there are stringy corrections. So the picture that we get in, uh, in uh, n equals four is that um, we have, uh, say here, A is the tooth coupling again, remember, if we go to weak coupling, we have the same shape as I showed you uh, before. So you have some collimated flux of energy at small angles when the detectors are closed, you have collimated flux of energy when detectors are opposite. And as you crank the coupling, when you go to strong coupling, jets disappear. So this, uh, this uh, spikes uh, manifestations of jets at weak coupling and the flat curve at strong coupling, which is a result of Hoffman Maldacena. It's a statement that there are no, no jets uh, at strong coupling. And uh, as I also mentioned that if you take uh, the small angle and the back-to-back -back, uh, expansion of the answer energy correlator in QCD, there is this maximal transcendentality principle that the energy correlators, uh, the, well, if you take the zeta function with maximal arguments, they correspond to, um, to n equals four. Um, so let me just summarize the, 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 again, the physical picture that we see uh, and we understand uh, so then we can, we can use it that at weak coupling we have jets. So um, if we, ah, yes. Unfortunately, there will be no movie because it's a PDF, yes. So here's supposed to be a movie, but of course there is no movie. But what I wanted to show is that uh, at weak coupling, this blob decays into two dots, if you wish, which are two particles in every, in every ev event. So the, the state, the, you should, the quantum state is really, you can think it's mostly dominated by jets, which is a very collimated fluxes of energy. And the energy correlator is to leading order is really a sum of delta functions. And then at finite coupling, they become some cones um, of energy. Whereas at strong coupling, the picture is uh, that there are no jets. And if you consider this quantum state, it just decays into the, this um, homogeneous blob and they, no matter how many detectors you insert, well, not too many, but uh, say not scaling with some parameters of the theory, the energy flux is homogeneous. So the quantum state reorganizes itself into this homogeneous blob. This is an uh, insight from perturbation theory. And uh, next, uh, let me ask a question. So okay, how do we interpolate between these two pictures? This is a finite coupling regime. And this is my uh, second part of the talk where I will try to talk now about this observables non perturbatively. <clears throat> uh, and, but, uh, but can you uh, kind of see a transition from one regime to the other? Or, I mean, uh, yeah, we, we will see the transition. Yeah, we'll see. yeah I will see the transition, uh, in, 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 at least in some sense. I, I, that's what I will be talking about now. Um, okay, so one, of course, uh, the powerful tool in uh, conformal field theory is uh, operator products expansion for local operators. It's, uh, it's uh, convergent in case of conformal field theories, and therefore we can study these cross equations, which are, of course, uh, very powerful. And uh, the way that's how we think about conformal field theory at finite coupling. And uh, the question uh, we can ask is that. Okay, now we have uh, this observable with light ray operators. Can we do something like this for the light rays? So we take, we would like to take two light ray operators and uh, you can convince yourself by conformal mapping is that, uh, so this picture here of the Minkowski space where you have two light ray operators at different angles. It's the same as uh, if we consider uh, Minkowski space with UV, which is X plus and X minus and transverse coordinate. It's the same as separating light rays in the transverse space. And therefore we can now, it's natural to consider when detectors are close to each other on the sphere. So it's small angles. It's a small transverse direction. Can we do the OP? And let me remind you that in the, behind the usual OP, say in Euclidean OP, the picture is the following. We take two operators, we can cut a little ball around them insert complete set of quantum states by state operator correspondence uh, given by local operators. And here we are, we just uh, re-expanded uh, the quantum state and the, on this ball in, in, a, in the basis of states and we got a, a local, um, the, the operator product expansion. But, but in this picture, you know, when I construct an API, you, you, 
uh, it certainly implies a hierarchy of uh, of scale, right, or momenta, right? Because you know, to, to write it this way, you need to say that this kind of, in certain sense, the external, with, no, I mean, uh, momenta are much larger than the one which, no, I mean, is exchange, right? Because otherwise, I'm not sure whether the notion of operator for expansion makes sense. Uh, uh, or, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, but uh, we, we will see, we will see that, say, for um, here, the inter interestingly, uh, due to conformal symmetry, uh, at least for the, for the conformal field theories, the, the scale, so the overall momentum, it does set some scale, but uh, then um, there is a small parameter, which is a small angles. And we can expand this observables, well, the event shapes in, in small okay. angles. But then, then this small angle uh, should work for you as a parameter, uh, I mean, kind of not like a large Q square, you know, in a normal sense, right? Yeah. Right? Right. So, so yeah. should you relate yes. that this, some distances which is in, 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 in internal are smaller than, you know, than external, right? In some, uh, yeah. Or... Yes, okay. yes. Um... Now, uh, an important difference between the picture, the usual picture for the Euclidean OP and uh, the light rays, which immediately you can ask. So to run this argument, it was really important that uh, I consider quantization of co-dimension one slices. So we have a, this, which is a radial quantization. We have a Hamiltonian, which is dilatation operator and we uh, decompose in a complete eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. For the light ray operators, we do not have such picture because uh, they already uh, sort of dimension one objects. And if we try to surround them like on this picture in a transverse plane, it's, a, it's, it's like trying to quantize the theory on co-dimension two uh, surfaces and we don't know how to do it. And therefore the light ray OPE as, as I presented, it will not, it will be of, at least at the moment, the way we understand it, I understand it, it's of different nature, we do not have the same non-perturbative argument. Maybe there is some non-perturbative argument, but the nature of the OPE is, is different. Nevertheless, even, even though we do not have such picture, somehow miraculously, uh, we can write this. This is Sorry, a question. Yeah. Wait so uh, this conformal transformation you're making to go from this uh, light ray up from these, uh, the, the sphere, right? to uh, the causal development of a ball to the two light ray operators, yeah. that acts similarly at I plus, right? Uh, also, yes, this, no. this conformal transformation is probably on the full Einstein manifold, right? And you're yes, cutting yes, yes. piece of it. So uh, could this be made to, like, could you could you deal with that rigorously or are you, are you assuming, imagining a puncture, puncturing a tiny hole at I plus? So here a note that, um, yeah, we, when we, well, as, as you say in this picture, I haven't explained it, but this point is actually identified. So I not as a point. So it's, uh, it's clear on the, on the usual Einstein map. Okay, maybe I'll go, it will take me to go too far, but you know, if I draw on a cylinder, I zero is really a point. And uh, so then uh, this map is just a stereographic projection. We, we can forget about Minkowski space, be on Einstein cylinder, but take a point, we emit a bunch of light rays. The space of directions of light rays is a sphere. And, That's right. uh, and then we, we can do the stereographic projection from this sphere to the plane. And- uh, But then there, there's the I plus, right? The yeah, but I would say in, in, a, in a CFT, I plus is, is nothing special, right? There is no real I plus. I mean, it's, we can think of it as I plus, but we're really living on a cylinder. So Wait, this, there's a limiting procedure going on, right? So you're, you're imagining cutting it, puncturing a small hole around I plus and making that small hole being arbitrarily small, I imagine. Is that, or something like that? No? No, I think, I, well, I think this is like this picture, for example, it's, uh, let's say we take this picture. So we just yeah. see all rays which are parallel. Let's draw now this picture on the Einstein cylinder. Sure. We will find that these two, line, two null rays meet at infinity. And, That's right. Uh, and then if we see it, if we put this infinity as a map to the origin, so we just shift our Poincaré patch, all the null rays will be uh, characterized by the direction on the sphere. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I think okay. the, All right. the, 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 just the, just the global transformations well defined on the Einstein cylinder and uh, yeah I don't think okay. thanks so uh, okay to to make the long story short I will jump I will present the answer uh, and then we'll try to explain every symbol in the sensor and uh, if you are if you uh, would like to see the beautiful harmonic analysis behind uh, there are 200 of it 200 pages of it in this papers where the formula derived in its full glory but i will just focus on uh, try to explain what are the main ingredients and uh, uh, what is the point so here's a claim that you can take the two detectors or two ANEC operators and uh, write it as a sum of other light ray operators so there was a similar claim in Hoffman Maldasena in 2008, and we would we would like to add, if you wish, two ingredients to the claim. First of all, in this uh, paper, there, there was a um, um, statement that the apparatus that appear on the right hand side has spin three, and uh, well, this uh, as I'll try to explain, it's actually not just spin three, but spin three, five, seven, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all the way to infinity apparatus that appear. And second, it was not clear in, the, in this paper, what are the basis of light ray operators? Like, okay, there are some abstract light ray operators, but how do we construct them? So the punchline of this story uh, of our discussion is that there is this formula where we know uh, what every symbol means and the statement that these are the all operators that appear here. So let me just start uh, explaining symbol by symbol what's, what are the ingredients and then uh, we, can, we can discuss. So first of all, there is a sum in the right hand side over i. And uh, well, here there is also n. But uh, this i symbol, it uh, denotes rigid trajectories. So usually in the right hand side of operators, we sum over all the local operators, but in the uh, in the right hand side of the product of two anx, we sum over rigid trajectories. Now, rigid trajectory is, as you know, uh, it's uh, this, uh, well, from chu frauchi plot, we have this dependence of delta over J, and usually it's uh, drawn for particles, but as we recently learned uh, to draw this lines also for operators. And uh, so each line in this chu frauchi plot is labeled by some I. So we sum over all, all these lines. Now, uh, what are these lines? Well, these lines are nothing but if you start with the OPE of say two stress tensors, you have a bunch of operators that appear there. And so these operators live on, live on rigid trajectories. And uh, the rigid trajectories which appear in the product of ANX, which are made of, out of stress tensors are nothing but the same rigid trajectories that appear on the, in the OPE of two stress tensors. Now, uh, not all the points from the rigid trajectories contribute. And uh, as you know, the rigid trajectories are labeled by what's called signature, which is plus or minus. It stands for the following fact. If you have in the OPE of two stress tensors, you have operators of odd and even spin. And if you take the all operators of even spin, they define the rigid trajectory, which is a, it's an even signature, which is denoted by plus. Same happens for the odd spin. If you combine them using this brassard Gribo or Simon formula, they get combined in some radio trajectory and they denote it by minus. So therefore this uh, symbol plus refers to the statement that uh, you take the OP of two stress tensors and you take a radio trajectories of the plus signature. So the radio trajectories on which operators of spin two, four, six, zero live. But then not you take this rigid trajectories and only particular points from this rigid trajectories contribute. For example, if you take the this black rigid trajectory, so if you start with a local OP, you will find local operators of spin two, four, six, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. However, in the light ray OP, the spins that contribute are remarkably odd. So you start with an even spin rigid trajectory and you continue spin to three say here and then to five, seven, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so then there is this important uh, quantum number, a little j, which I will explain uh, soon, but uh, let me now first 
say a few words about the symbol, which I haven't explained yet. What is this O? How do I define O? And uh, this was done in this paper by uh, Peter Kravchuk and David Simmons Duffin, uh, where they essentially you take a partial wave expansion of Euclidean uh, CFT, you define a partial wave. So this delta lives on the principal series. And then you find the following fact that if you try to take this partial wave uh, projection, so decomposition of the product of two local operators, phi1 and phi2, they order it as say phi1, phi2 plus phi2, phi1, and you project it into to some partial waves, to some uh, uh, objects that transform irreducibly on the conformal group with some delta and j, where delta lives in principal series, you can do it some, with some conformal kernel. And what you find that if you take this Euclidean object, if you weak rotate it and you light transform, uh, then you can continue it in spin. That's uh, closely related to this inversion formula. And then you get the representation of this object for every spin. And uh, the residues, uh, well, originally, if you take, uh, if you have a partial wave expansion of the correlator, you have this partial waves, and then the local apparatus has a appears as residues of this object for integer spin. Now the light ray operators are defined as the residues of this uh, by local object with a kernel, which is fixed by conformal symmetry. Uh, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but, yeah. this, but the integration here goes over uh, Minkowski space? Or... Yeah, yeah, integration goes over Minkowski space, but then you can see that, uh, um, yeah, yeah, I haven't, I wasn't uh, not uh, very precise here about the region of integration, but you integrate over Minkowski space uh, with some causal relations, but what you see that to generate the pole, the integral is dominated by both operators being localized along the light ray. Right, but but in this sense, uh, it looks like your definition uh, could be completely in Minkowski, and it, you are not using in Euclidean. Yeah, flow. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and it's true. You can you can forget about Euclidean space, and in uh, in, in the last paper, I guess we discussed a little okay, bit, okay. but that's how it was introduced somehow first, and I guess it's connected. Um, and uh, and then uh, so when 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 the, as I tr already tried to explain when the spin uh, when the spin is integer this object it just becomes an integral of a local operator like we discussed the uh, integral of a light ray of a stress tensor um, and then the plus corresponds to even spins minus to odd spins so this is what happens for integer spins for non-integer spins this is an abstract definition this is some truly non-local object and uh, that is what it is. So let me now go back to the first part of my talk and you can ask, okay, let me apply this formula to the, this experiment that I consider. So this is a new formula. Here I consider the operator which acts on the vacuum to be a scalar. And the new formula is a non-perturbative formula which takes you this energy energy correlator and, and writes it as a sum of our conformal blocks. So F of zeta are some known function, some hypergeometric function. And the uh, sum, as I already told you, is run is over ready trajectories. Now the dynamical data is the OP data evaluated for the spin three. So you have to take three point functions, continue to them to spin three, the same for anomalous dimension. And uh, well, we check that it agrees with perturbative results and uh, well, it's a correct formula. So, uh, Yes, so you can check it, uh, say, perturbatively. In practice, you can ask, what does it mean, spin three? And, and in practice, if you take, a, if you know one loop correlator, if you know the strong coupling correlator, it's very simple, have a very simple OP decomposition. If you ever looked at it, and so then you can read the, the OP data as a function of spin, analytically continue it to spin three, and uh, plug into the formula, and you get uh, the, the right results, of course, as it should. And the sum here is again sum over the ready trajectories. And now we can understand uh, the interpolation, how jets disappear uh, a little bit more quantitatively. So if you look at the, as I told you, the jets are this uh, collimated fluxes of energy. And if you look at the small distance, uh, uh, small angle OP of uh, two energy detectors, it's controlled by the, uh, sorry, it has to be, so some technical reason it should be, it's, it is minus one, here should be three. So this shift is due to supersymmetry, but um, what you find is that uh, the small angle asymptotic is controlled by the anomalous dimension of the twist three, twist two spin three operator. 
And when uh, this gamma, which is anomalous dimension at weak coupling, it is very small. So you have the singularity one over theta square, almost. And this corresponds to having jets. And when uh, you go to strong coupling, this gamma of two becomes very large. And so this OP becomes regular. Now, uh, using uh, integrability and the work of this uh, gentleman here, you can compute this. You can find this anomalous dimension as a function of toothed coupling. Uh, just you can compute it. And then you see, say, here, the energy correlator becomes regular when gamma, uh, this anomalous dimension, becomes equal to 2. And then you see that it becomes equal to 2 when toothed coupling is whatever it is there, it's something like 10. Um, hey, but yeah. your uh, this for loops long and weak uh, looks like happened before this, or or it's something you see that uh, it, it's smaller coupling. I, I'm not uh, this picture, right? Yeah. So the, so the rest, yeah, there is a blue curve, which is uh, so it's uh, this gamma two is known in the weak coupling expansion. So let's plot this gamma two as a function of tooth coupling and weak coupling. It looks like this. So it starts disagreeing somewhere here. A strong coupling is, uh, well, that's how it looks. And uh, the underlying curve is the exact result from integrability. So, uh, right, but but uh, looking at this uh, comparison uh, stuff, I, I would get uh, things that, you know, it's happened about uh, 0.5, right? I mean, some yeah. change regime. And looking there, it looked like not 0.5, it's like, I don't know, 3 or whatever, you know, the, the value of, uh, of A. Uh, no, yeah, I, yeah. So, so, so in this sense, um, I mean, still looks like uh, kind of so coupling starts earlier than 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 a equal uh, say three, right? It starts after point five or not? Um, well, here this point maybe maybe what you, what you're suggesting is that maybe this point we shouldn't think too much about this point. So I chose this point as a point where just the function become. Uh, right, right, but regular. It's far away, right? Already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so maybe I, if we if we if we smear it a little bit, we will find that uh, the, the characteristic change uh, of the shape uh, happening earlier. So I'm not. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's what I'm wondering about. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's, it could be. Now uh, let me tell you uh, um, about this interesting character, little J. Which is also which is a, something which I have not explained in this formula, and uh, this little j is a called uh, is called transverse spin, and if, if you see that um, uh, if you look say if you look at the uh, op of two stress tensors, there is a only transverse spin zero to point four that appear, and if you look at this transverse spin four vector trajectory, uh, you see that the interestingly not only spin three but spin three five seven, nine, 11, and all the way to infinity that contribute. So why is that? How come? Um, let me explain a little bit. So first of all, what is the transfer spin? So let's take some uh, tensor representation of Lorentz group. We can draw a young diagram for it. And so the first row is what I call spin. The, the number of boxes in the first row is what I call spin. And the transfer spin uh, is the number of boxes in the second row. So if you look at the say uh, OP of two stress tensors in four dimensions, you will find that in conformal field theory, only these representations appear zero to and four. This follows from conformal symmetry. However, if you if you take this uh, light ray, if you look at the light ray operator and you look at this transverse spin, this transverse spin is nothing but its spin on the celestial sphere. Or if we take a celestial sphere and map it to the plane, uh, now effectively you have this object which is like a local operator transforms like a local operator in this plane. And it has a spin J, which is mapped through this, uh, this simple relation to the transfer spin of the original local operator. And now uh, that's what, so we wrote this paper last year and we run into the puzzle. Uh, and the puzzle is familiar from the conformal bootstrap and involves trying to study associativity of the light operators. Imagine you take three detectors. Then uh, you take the OP between the two. And let's say there is some non-analytic behavior. And you can ask, how do you reproduce this behavior from the other channel? And well, we know very well from the, uh, 
the usual bootstrap is that the way it's reproduced is that you start building up some kind of dipoles which are built out of the large spin operators. So but this, I, uh, I, not, sorry, yeah. but uh, uh, this, uh, trans, what you call transverse spin, uh, no, in certain sense, it should be related to kind of in terms of the trajectory to what we call normal spin, right, as well, right? Or uh, uh, No, it, no, no, no. It's, uh, it's, so, not, so, it's not the same. Yes, yes. So there, what, what we call the normal spin is uh, what I called here this first line spin. And this is and this controls the spin of the original trajectory and transference spin labels. It's always discrete. Okay. And it's the the discrete. other one, in, in case of uh, Lorentz group, it, uh, it is uh, what's called, uh, uh, how it's called? Uh, twist, right? Uh, that no, I mean no, normally in in in, uh, in normal yeah. stuff, there is a there is spin and there is a twist, right? Yeah. Difference of of Lorentz parameter. So so your transversal spin should be uh, twist related or what? No, no, no. I think it's different. So here, I say this, we can think of this plot as a function of a twist, uh, twist as a function of a spin. So this is a normal Regis trajectory. Now what I'm saying is there is on top of this additional quantum number which is discrete. And it labels uh, the number of boxes in the representation that appears in the Lorentz so, group. So, so this quantum number is not a part of normal uh, 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 Lorentz normal Lorentz presentation. Has two parameters, right? That's it. I mean, spin and twist. No, no. This is only for, this is only true for a symmetric traceless tensor, right? But if we can have a more general tensor, we we have to draw a Young tableau. Uh -huh. So this is. Not if you have symmetric traceless tensors, then I agree it's twist and spin. But more generally, you will have say two two rows, mm -hmm. and the uh, number of boxes in the second row is a uh, is uh, what I call. Uh, I see. So so you are saying that there is an additional parameter just a normal Lorentz representation. Yeah, yeah, it's completely usual. It's a, it it is absent in three dimensions, but in four dimensions, it's exactly yeah, it's, it's what we have. Okay, okay. So uh, we have this. Uh, I was talking about this uh, puzzle is that you immediately expect that if you if you have three detectors, you go to one channel, there is some non elasticity therefore it has to be reproduced by crossing from the other channel by large spin operators. But uh, we did our analysis uh, last year and it looked like uh, the spin transverse spin was truncated in the OP. And then you see the immediately paradox and if, if the transverse spin is truncated. And this, so this is a celestial sphere. We will never be able to satisfy crossing with some non-trivial behavior because you expect that really large spin operators have to solve this problem. And indeed, uh, the resolution of this puzzle is that there is no miracle. Uh, there, there is no some miraculous truncation of the OPE, but there is a very subtle mechanism how this large transverse spin operators appear. And uh, why it is subtle is exactly because, as I told you, that if you start with the original stress tensors and look at their OPE, the transverse spin is truncated. So there are no rigid trajectories with transverse spin larger than four. Therefore, if this transverse spin higher than four operators appears, they should appear in some different way. And indeed, they do appear as a different way. And the resolution is that they appear as primary descendants. What are the primary descendants? Primary descendants are objects which transform as conformal primaries. Nevertheless, you can write them as a derivative of some operators. So therefore, the, the, what happens is that there is a set of conformal differential operators, uh, which are such that when you, you can take an operator of some spin, say j plus n minus one and transfer spin j, and you act with them, with this operators on them, and you will get an operator with a spin reduced and transverse spin increased. And that's exactly what is the role of this green point here. You take this, say, spin four, spin four operators, uh, so transverse spin four and uh, usual spin five operators, you act on it with this conformal differential operator, and then you get higher transverse spins. No, but but in this sense, higher higher spins are kind of a derivative of uh, a lower one, right? In in this sense, so, so higher, this... trans, higher transverse spin operators are derivative of lower transverse spin operators. Yes, right. So in certain sense, uh, in, in, it is still absence of higher spins in this sense, right? Yes, they're still absent. So indeed, you might have thought that this picture where we just I draw this rigid trajectories, which were continuation of local operators, maybe the basis was not enough. 
You know, maybe there are completely new elytra operators which are responsible for this. And this formula is not correct. But no, that's actually not true. The operators which we already have are enough to solve this paradox. And, but they solve it in an incredibly subtle way. And uh, let me say a few words about this conformal differential operators. So uh, they usually we have a Verma module, which has the structure. You have, you know, primary operator and then we have descendants when we act with the derivative. But we know that this is not always the case. For example, if we take a, a conserved current or operator with Verma module with dimension d minus one and one, it contains a submodule which is generated by a primary descendant. And usually conserved currents are short representation where we take this uh, Verma module d minus one one and we mod out by this submodule, which is the same as conservation of currents. However, there are more general uh, representations and conformal differential operators which appear in the representation theory of conformal group. They are analyzed, for example, recently or classified in this paper by Benedonis, uh, Trevizani, and Yamazaki. And usually in physics, we do not talk about this differential operators very often because it happens that they exist. Uh, well, this we all know, but many of them, they, they do not play any role for local operators because they violate unitarity bounds. In the unitary theory, quantum numbers satisfy these bounds. And you find that uh, these operators, they, they do play an important role in conformal bootstrap because they appear as the poles of the conformal block. But for the local operators, we never encounter them due to unitarity. However, what happens is that they play an important role for light ray operators, and maybe that's their role in life or partially. And this is related to the fact, which I haven't explained, but if you take a local operator and you do this light transform, if you integrate it along the null ray, its quantum numbers get flipped. So you get, if you start with the dimension, operator dimension delta and spin j, you get, sorry, there is a mistake, it should be one minus j and one minus delta. And therefore, if you start with something unitary, you formally get an object which transforms strangely, but it is completely natural for the light ray operators. Uh, but uh, but in this case, when you talk about exclusion, uh, is it uh, uh, correct to, to, to suggest that it is um, associated with kind of conserved currents in the theory, right? No, 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 no. No, these are really different. I think this are really, there is nothing conserved about these operators. They are not protected. No, no, but when we are talking about d mu, g mu equals zero, for example, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. it was a special feature, right? This was a uh, special and, feature, yeah. Uh, but uh, it doesn't continue to higher spins, right? No, no, no. And uh, this, uh, this really is this conformal differential operator here. Uh, no, no, I'm trying to say that ex ex exceptions were for uh, because there were conserved currents for lower spins, right? Yeah. Uh, and when you're going to higher spins, there is no consideration, so there is no exceptions. Um, yes, uh, you can. We can say that, but I want to emphasize that the, here we're going to the higher spin in this uh, very, very, so I guess for me, the, the, the very important point about the slide is that we, we have this example of local operators, mm -hmm. but the world of this conformal differential operators really becomes much more, much richer for light ray operators. Because when you go to light ray operators, it happens that this differential operator start playing an important role. This mm -hmm. other differential operators, which yeah. were known no, to- I them. got the point. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so now, uh, uh, now we are supposed to be at the, at the point where I explained every symbol on the slide. So uh, little j is a transfer spin. We sum over uh, this n as differential operators. Uh, you have points on the regular trajectories. And uh, the way you derive this formula is you just uh, use, a, if you wish, uh, this properties of the conformal group. It follows from uh, sophisticated uh, conformal symmetry plus uh, some uh, Lorentz and uh, uh, properties of the theory that it makes sense in Minkowski, it's rigid bounded, etc. So let me spend my last minute just to say how do you transverse, how do you detect this transverse spin in the experiment? What does it correspond to? And uh, the relevant observable is, is the so-called oriented event shapes. So usually when, uh, when people study say this object, or very often when this uh, observable, the, this uh, density matrix of, of the state generated by current J nu and J nu 
uh, it's uh, it has two indices and so it is spin two very often there is there is a uh, in practice people not only say average over polarizations but also the average over the beam direction so this is just for some reason experimentalists do that uh, sometimes not always but and uh, when you do that you can check through the formulas that what happens is that you just project out all the transverse spin in other words this transverse spin it manifests itself when uh, uh, when you have say some beam this vertical axis and then you have two detectors and one and then two and then if you rotate one detector along the other and if your target has some spin uh, these operators do contribute to such event shapes. So they contribute when, when the, the, the operator that acts on the vacuum carries some spin and we do not average over it too much. And finally, as I tried to explain, uh, there was this puzzle with the three point, the, with the associativity was three point energy correlator and uh, it was related to transfer spin. And so therefore this, this operator is also relevant. There is really a qualitative difference, what I would maybe want to say is that when you study these observables for two energy correlators and when you go to three, there is really a qualitative jump because uh, now that all transverse spin light ray operators start contributing. Whereas for this guy, only the operators that contribute, uh, they depend on the spin of the target. You can show that. And uh, maybe uh, just to, uh, uh, to to wrap it up, there was this recent cute paper with a, you know, we're familiar all with the position space double slit experiment where you have two, two rays of light and then we have an interference picture. You can ask, how do you say, can you measure say spin of a blue one in, in, uh, in this experiment? And uh, there is, or how do we run a double slit experiment for the blue one? And uh, there was this proposal in this paper where we take three energy detectors and uh, we have say some quark which goes to the detector and it emits a gluon. And because the gluon can carry a plus or minus helicity and they, this amplitude sign superposition, we naturally get interference between, between these two processes. And what happens is then if you take these two detectors, this uh, which are denoted by this uh, purple phi here and you rotate them along each other, then you will see the modulation with some cosine and the, 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 pow the power of cosine is directly related to the spin of the gluon. And this dependence on, uh, of the, on this phi when you rotate two detectors along each other, it's nothing but this transverse spin quantum number, which was uh, so important to make consistent uh, light ray OPE. Okay, let me, uh, because I'm running out of time, I will not talk about uh, gravity. So I will just conclude is that, uh, so there are many interesting directions and, uh, and, uh, and uh, questions uh, here, maybe on the, the most conceptual level, um, I haven't, um, when you don't really understand what is a space of light ray operators. Okay, this is some light ray operators which are important. There are some other operators which are known in QCD, but uh, say rigorously in a conformal field theory, what is the complete basis of light ray operators? Um, we don't know yet. And uh, if we understand it, then we can do some kind of celestial bootstrap where we study associativity of these operators. Um, then this uh, light rays and event shapes uh, are related to uh, new Lorentzian methods and uh, in conformal field theory. Um, there are closely related developments with dispersion, dispersion relations and some rules. There are also dispersive methods in quantum gravity, which I, I haven't explained, unfortunately, but closely related to to the story. And finally, uh, I think the, it's very interesting how to, I mean, we, we are used to conformal field theory as a Euclidean uh, theories at the points of phase transitions, but there are also quantum critical points where, which are Lorentzian conformal field theories. And it would be interesting to understand if one can shape, uh, study this event shapes in the lab. And um, also, as, as I tried to explain, there is this story of higher transverse spin light ray operators, and they either appear in oriented event shapes or event shapes where the target has a spin and we don't average over beam or in the multipoint multi event shapes. 
And uh, to conclude, let me just show you this uh, slide from the talk by Jesse Teller. And there is, a, I guess, a paper which is coming out where, as I told you, the, um, uh, the people who study on the work on the actual collider physics study now energy correlators at LHC. And I think they should be, this, uh, this paper should be out soon. And uh, there was this quote from, again, uh, the paper that uh, there's really this uh, interesting uh, collaboration between the CFT and the JET community, which hopefully will lead to some interesting results. So thank you. Thanks so much, Sasha, for the wonderful talk. Um, let's thank Sasha. Are there any questions? Uh, I am sorry to, to ask too many questions, so but still, no I I cannot stop myself. Like right? it's it's not good. But, <laughs> but uh, I wonder that in certain sense the picture um, uh, it should have some kind of thing interpretation as well, right? Because when you uh, you we are not talking about gravity dual whatever, but still you know just the very notion of uh, rigid trajectories whatever. Uh, no, I mean implies that there is something there which is uh, stringy like, right? I would say not necessarily. I think that uh, lately the, the the notion of rigid trajectory is completely general and uh, does not right. But in terms of physical states, you would say that it is kind of uh, no, I mean in terms uh, like uh, the say, sun. In, 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 in n equals four, I agree, it's a string. It's... Yeah, right, right. But 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 when you are talking about say uh, say gravity dual, for example, it also yeah. implies that something you know. Um, okay. So so in this way, um, you know, kind of uh, no. I'm just wondering because it could give, give you some kind of physical interpretation of you know of uh, this transversal spin or whatever. Uh, uh, is what that's why I'm asking. Yeah, I, I don't. I'm not sure, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I actually no. You're you're uh, you're saying uh, something. I think which historically the way we thought about this OPE because in this original paper by Hoffman and Maldacena, when, well, well, they suggested that some some kind of light ray OPE should exist, even though we don't mm -hmm. know how exactly to think about it. But the way they think about it is that if you map it to the gravity dual, you see that the light ray OPE is mapped to the OPE on the wall shed. And uh, on the world sheet, people thought already about this. Uh, well, the OP on the world sheet is uh, much more conventional. And uh, people in, uh, already uh, thought about it, maybe Polchinski and Strasser. And so the operators which appear there are uh, sort of well, or well, at least known. But uh, this development was a transverse spin, which we, this is a recent paper that we wrote. Uh, uh, months ago, uh, we haven't tried to understand in detail the mapping of this picture with these differential operators and all these rigid trajectories in the CFT, mm -hmm. how it maps to the stringy picture. And, uh, yeah, but, but you see, uh, I would say that the main feature of, uh, you know, kind of the stringy picture is that uh, your uh, uh, kind of uh, large energies are, are correspond to large distances, right? So you're going, far, no, I mean, at large distances, at large energies, and uh, and in the, your ray pro, uh, this ray approach you are talking about, uh, something like that does happen, right? Because you are integrating along this, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, ray directions. Uh, so in this sense, uh, you uh, you're absorbing this, right? I mean, this idea is that uh, uh, kind of uh, a large. Uh, Longitudinal directions are important. So, 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 so in this way, it's, it looks like uh, you know it's a kind of part of of, of the approach where, where which uh, no, reminds this kind of you know uh, what happened in, in things. So, so in some sense, what I'm asking implies that that when you're going there to large energies, you are approaching to kind of non-local uh, kind of formulation in certain sense because I mean. With things you, you do have this alpha prime or whatever you have parameter, right? Uh, 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 Where well, you started from local theory, but in certain sense you have a transition, uh, uh, and that's why I'm you know, uh, wondering, you know, if you have something analog of alpha prime, what what is it would be? Yeah, so on the on the wall sheet, it's uh, it's it it is very it is very important uh, exactly that that we are dealing with a string, and so if uh, 
And there is, a, of course, subtleties that it will be an ADS, but as Hoffman, Maldasen, and discussed that you can map it to the flat space, and you see that indeed uh, the effectively what, what is happening is that we are integrating over the energies. And uh, well, it is it is clear that if we take an object and we localize it in some plus direction, infinitely yeah. localized, it, it will have infinite energy in the minus. And it's mapped to the fact that in the string amplitudes, we have to integrate over energy all the way to infinity. And of course, there, the fact that string regizes with some trajectory is important and you get this, uh, all these effects. Um, so I think it's all, uh, it's, uh, it is indeed true, and uh, it is what, how it works in in in, in the duality. Um, I think it's uh, here. Say the power of this formula is that it is uh, completely general. So in particular, well, it has to apply to any CFT, and uh, and it's true that for some CFTs with string dual, it will the, the, the relevant states will be this simple Walsh string, but for some strings with high, 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 high spin gravity dual, for example, when the Walsh is not local, this picture with the local Walsh OP, I expect it will, it will break down. So the, it will be quite different. So I think this, uh, yes, yeah, this, uh, um, there is a, yes, yeah, there is a, Definitely, uh, this story with LP on the wall chip, uh, but this story of the light show is, is more general. Okay, thank you. In sense it's more general because it's it, it's related to conformal symmetry. We I haven't used uh, string here. So. Okay, are there any other questions? Uh, I have one. No, uh, yes. Go ahead. Uh, I wanted to ask about the lab experiment, like you said in the kitchen table. Suppose you create these gases, we have a critical yeah. point. So I understand if you plug it at strong coupling, maybe you create like a spherical wave. But a weak coupling, I guess you create a bunch of phonons, but I don't see how you're going to create some shapes. In QCD, it's because you create just two particles, but then because of QCD, you get a lot of more particles. A hadrons, I mean, but if not, you will just see two particles. That means you only need to create like two phonons of very low energy. I'm not uh, sure how you create the shape. Well, yes, yes. The thing is that um, it's in a, in a lab, uh, if we take uh, some quantum critical point like 3 Ising model, it's a strongly coupled, right? Model, so there is no really phonons or it's some strongly coupled state of matter, but the things that I don't know how to do, or at least I haven't seen the discussion is that, of, as you said, we, we prepare say the sample, we hit it with a hammer and then uh, something propagates from it, but how to actually measure this energy flux in the lab? In theory, you can do this epsilon expansion so for small epsilon is weakly yeah. coupled and for large for epsilon one is yeah, uh, yeah. strongly yeah. coupled. So you can do some calculation, but you could yeah, also yeah. have a, Free theory with no massless particles, which is a quantum. I mean, it's a conformal, and but then does it depend on the operator you you use? I mean, I, I don't see where you put the operator that you use to alter the. Um, I think well, so it's, say if we if we have some. In general, this event shapes they, they have dependence on the on the operator which we uh, acting on the vacuum, but. The gross features like having jets or not having jacks, I don't think they are they are very sensitive to this because they are sort of controlled by the structure of the spectrum of the theory. And if the if the states become heavy, all, all states by double trace operators become heavy. For all event shapes, we will get this picture that uh, there is uh, no jets. In 3D Ising, I think it's an interesting open question: Does 3D Ising model have jets or not? This is something to be computed and uh, and seen. And I think with modern technology, in principle, this is something that uh, can be answered. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, yes, I have. I have a very basic question. Yeah. So I think you had the gamma two plus, and then you yes. discussed the coupling yeah. constant. And uh, is this itself a coupling constant, or is this some parameter that describes coupling? Yes, yeah, so uh, let me ex explain again. Uh, imagine, uh, say, uh, there is a set of minimal twist operators. They're called twist two operators. You say take phi phi and a bunch of derivatives. Okay. For example, so this uh, this uh, this operators exist for any spin. For spin two, this is a, say you can cook as stress tensor. This is an example of twist two operator. 
okay. for spin higher than two, th these are part of the string states. So now they, they, this, uh, this trajectory is defined for every spin and uh, taking spins two, four, six, et cetera, defines for you a function of dimension as a function of spin for this twist operator. So this gamma two, it's a uh, anomalous dimension of these operators at spin three. Okay. So um, it is a anomalous dimension. It's related to the coupling in a sense that weak coupling it's small, at strong coupling it's very large. But if you really, if you, for example, it's strong coupling, it's, it, it behaves like square, square root of, I think it behaves like um, lambda to the one quarter. It's at small coupling, it's linear in lambda. But it has this feature that for small coupling, it's small and for large coupling, it's large. But it's not really a toothed coupling. But we can think of this as a definition of the coupling. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, if there are no other questions, let's thank Sasha again, virtually. And uh, thank okay. you so much, Sasha. Uh, so if you don't mind, we'll post this video on YouTube. Uh, sure. Hopefully we'll have you visit in person once this COVID is over. <laughs> I very much hope so.